Welcome back everyone at day two of the European Sustainable Energy Week 2023. I'm glad to see so many faces of you back here for the first session of the second day. And also welcome to you everyone watching online. Good to see you again. Um, we're going to do day two because we had an amazing yesterday day yesterday with of course the opening session with amongst others the Energy Commissioner Kadri Simpson. We handed out some awards to fascinating people performing uh, an outstanding uh, way in, in transforming our economy, our society, uh, pushing that clean energy transition. And of course, we dove into that first big theme, which was skills. And today we have two other big themes uh, lined up for you with lots of policy sessions and a keynote also today to, to kick off. Because what is the best way to reach our clean energy targets? Maybe it is to save energy. Energy efficiency is key to this clean energy transition. But what if innovations and investments like heat pumps or electric cars are not affordable to everyone yet? How do we make sure that energy poverty is not a thing anymore in the near future? How do we include all citizens in this transition towards a low carbon economy? Today we'll have 24 policy sessions on two big topics, both here in the Charlemagne building. Uh, I'd like to remind you that it's not just on this floor, but also on the other floors. And of course, in the Martins Hotel. And so the two uh, themes that we're going to cover is energy efficiency and affordability and inclusion. And we'll do 12 policy sessions here um, and 12 policy sessions uh, on the other theme. And again, Fear of missing out is not necessary because we are going to stream everything, record everything, so you can rewatch the uh, other sessions if you like later. At the end of the day, at 6:30, I'd like to invite you all to come to the uh, Manergy Talk at the Martins Hotel, featuring Jens Burkhardt, the Boston Consultancies Group Managing Director, who's going to give a talk and his perspective. So I'd like to all see you there at 6.30 at the Martins Hotel. And now, if you're watching this online, uh, please also feel free to join whatever session you like. Uh, you can just click on the main program, the session that you like, and there uh, access the online program. There will also be Wi-Fi again available at all venues. Uh, we'll get the, uh, the Wi-Fi details on screen uh, it's not my name, uh, it's, uh, it's actually this code, uh, EC Guest Network, just click on that and you can join also the network. The policy sessions will all be run in English, but the keynote I'm going to introduce to you uh, in a minute, that will be interpreted into uh, at least six languages, I think. So that's going to be German, English, French, Italian, Dutch, Spanish and Polish. So just for this plenary session, for the keynote speech, you can follow live interpretation, either with your headsets uh, for the people here in the room, but for the people watching online, in the drop-down menu, you can find the different languages to follow this session. Now, for the people here on site, I hope you've already enjoyed the energy fair, and if you haven't, there's over 35 uh, different stands with organizations, associations, and projects represented, so go ahead and do some networking and uh, get some inspiration from the people there. I think those were my housekeeping points uh, to kickstart the day. Now much more interesting is the following speaker I'm going to introduce to you. She will outlay today's big topics, as I said, energy efficiency and inclusion and affordability. And uh, one person who knows all about these topics, who works on this on a daily basis, is Mechtild Wurstdurfer. She is the Deputy Director at the European Commission's DG Energy. And in her keynote, she will further elaborate on these two thematic blocks. Please give a warm hand for Mechtild Wurstdurfer. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Dylan, and very much a warm welcome for me for that second day of the EU Sustainable Energy Week. You heard a lot what was said yesterday, 
under the overall topic of accelerating the clean energy transition towards lower bills and greater skills. And today, it's really very much on energy efficiency, just transition, affordable prices. I think those topics, and I will introduce them a bit more, are really absolutely key. I think you all heard about energy efficiency first principle. I'm very happy and proud that the Commission finally put that also in our legislation, in our regulatory framework with the Energy Efficiency Directive. So the first step is done, but I think there's much, much more to be done to implement it. Those who have been working on energy efficiency know how hard it is to do really structural changes. So I will explain a little bit today in that first address to you, and there is multiple occasions during the day then to go deeper in that aspect of energy efficiency, just transition, affordable include, inclusion. When we speak about last year's crisis, energy crisis, unprecedented with high energy prices, definitely in the end of August, but during the whole year, everyone suffered, but mostly the vulnerable consumers. So the topic of, in the short term, energy savings, so I think what we achieved that there is more consciousness how to save energy, the Commission run several campaigns, others, the International Energy Agency had a 10-point plan. So we all managed to be more aware on energy savings potential. But there's also a, mid, a bit more the medium on structural changes I will speak more about on energy efficiency. And I think that will help to lower our bills, both for vulnerable consumers, for consumers in general, for SMEs, small and medium-sized companies, and for industry in general. What we try to achieve also in our latest proposal on the electricity market design is how to empower consumers and protect consumers, both. We are all here consumers, so we know how much more we could do being empowered via whatever tools, smart meters or other tools, but also there's a role of governments to protect consumer now that we are, I wouldn't say out of the crisis, but at least on the peak of the, uh, what we had seen last year, I think there's still a lot of uncertainties also when we go to the next winter, 23, 24, but we should learn from the lessons from last year and also build that in when we speak further. So I will speak around energy efficiency and energy poverty and what are the key policy instruments to tackle both issues. I will touch upon what's possible also on the financial side and Thirdly, a little bit an outlook, what we are doing in terms of commission member states policies in, in the next couple of months. I think when we speak about energy efficiency, we often link it to climate goals and that's the right approach. But as I mentioned, we also need to link it to affordability for our consumers and households, but also on energy security less energy we consume, the more we are secure and less dependent from imports, but also jobs. There is a huge potential of jobs and growth in some sectors like construction sector when we speak about, for example, buildings, but more generally, there are different solutions, different companies who can come in and create jobs around energy efficiency. The most effective solution also when it comes to energy poverty is that we work on energy efficiency and we work on just and inclusive transition. I think the social consequences of last year were enormous. It didn't touch only the poor consumer, the vulnerable, as I already mentioned, but for the first time, I think, at least in the recent years, it also affected middle-income households who had to struggle with these high energy bills. So when we look at what can be done, we had a number of emergency legislation last year which were adopted, uh, proposed by the Commission and adopted in record time by the member states. 
There were also a lot member states that out of our, what we call, toolbox. So social measures, vouchers, reduce VAT rates, and all that. That helped to really the immediate crisis. But really, as I said, we would like to focus now also on the structural changes around uh, energy efficiency. We have adopted, in that sense, one key legislative file, which is the revision of the Energy Efficiency Directive. We had the last trialogue in March, and now it's more the procedural final step in both Council and Parliament until it will be uh, uh, published in the official journal and then obviously implemented. I think we have achieved clear results in this energy efficiency directive. We are now looking at 11.7% uh, of energy efficiency if we compare to our reference scenario of 2020. And we are also looking at, this is a binding target at EU level, but we are also looking at additional, uh, co that is linked, sorry, to cost optimal path that what we analyzed that these 11.7%, which was the compromise between Parliament and Council, we had proposed 13% out of Repower, but I think still it's a very good compromise because it's a cost-efficient solution. Because when we look at what's possible, we look also at the cost to achieve these and the benefits. And in our analysis, this outcome of the Energy Efficiency Directive reflects exactly that. It's a cost uh, efficient solution or scenario for 2030. And there is a lot what member states can do, and we will ask them, or they are required, to achieve new sa savings each year of 1.49%, so nearly 1.5% of final energy consumption on average between 24 and 2030. So this is starting now that we look at the member states who have to increase nearly double, it's now 0.8% to go to nearly 1.5% new energy savings. And that should be in the end sectors like buildings, industry, and transport. Another element of that energy efficiency directive which was agreed that we look at the public sector. We want the public sector to lead by example. And that's why we have brought in additional measures for the public sectors on heating and cooling, but we also strengthened the financial provisions. All in that, we looked in particular, as the link of today is really to look on the definition of energy poverty, which we have also now included. Because in our directive, there's a general obligation for member states to take measures to empower and protect people affected by energy poverty, people in low-income households, vulnerable customers, and people living in social housing. So this is also a new element out in our energy efficiency directive. Linked to that, if I stay with the regulatory environment, which is one of the drivers to make things happen, is the energy uh, performance of building directive, EPBD, because buildings, as you know, are 40 percent of our energy consumption. So we want also to look how to make these buildings more energy efficient. This is about new buildings where a lot has already been done, but it's also about the existing buildings, which is much harder in cities like Brussels, but also Paris and others, to really make them more energy efficient. And we also know that one third of the population in the EU is at risk of poverty, lives in poor living conditions in buildings which are not uh, really well or uh, energy efficient. So renovating those buildings where also there is a link between low income and also social buildings or buildings which are not in a good shape, that is the focus or one of the focus of our energy performance of building directive. 
Out of all that, I think we should also look at the benefits which come out when you renovate your buildings of the minimum energy performance standards and all what we are discussing right now with Parliament and Council because this directive is in interinstitutional negotiations. There are multiple benefits when we speak about renovation. It can, not in the short term, but in the medium term, reduce energy bills and also great jobs improve health and well-being and overall living conditions. And that's why I think these two, the Energy Efficiency Directive, but also the buildings, is something we work together with member states. As I said, a second element out of this regulatory environment, which is there to create the right conditions, the structural changes needed, is the financing. And there is a huge financial challenge to make that happen. That's why we analyzed that we have, until 2030, an investment gap of at least 165 billion a year on the energy efficiency financing needs. And you will hear a little bit more throughout the day, but let me also underline that we are in cooperation with financial institution, which is really essential. In this regard, the Energy Efficiency Financial Institutions Group, what we call EFIC, or what is called EFIC, and there are other sessions during the day today, they, that EFIC has over the past 10 years pioneered and strengthened this cooperation with financial institution. We believe that by working together, policymakers, energy companies, financial institutions, they can look at technical bottlenecks for investments in energy efficiency. We are all know that in order to make a step forward in financing on energy efficiency, a lot of smaller projects have to be done. That's the difference, for example, with renewables. If you have a big offshore wind park, it's a big investment, it's very visible. For energy efficiency, you need a sum of sometimes smaller investments, sometimes bigger investment, but in order to make a change, you need to aggregate, you need to look at risks, you need to work together with a financial institution. We have also established, or are about to establish, from the Commission side, the new Social Climate Fund, which will also prioritize energy efficiency and building renovation measures. And not to forget that the Commission has set up Just Transition Fund, for those regions who are in transition, it was initially meant to be transition away from coal, but the concept is being now a little bit broader, but we have several regions where are the Just Transition Fund or the Just Transition Region, we are work in different uh, 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 regions of our member states. We had recently a big event in Estonia and in a few weeks some, uh, an event in Czech Republic with the, uh, with the Just Transition Fund. There's also obviously the structural funds, 30% of the EU budget is in the structural funds, and we are working very closely with our colleagues in DG Regio, in regional policy, to make sure that some of that money goes to energy efficiency or renewables measures. Like the same for Recovery Fund, where we have been working with the member states, and we know there's a lot of good things happening, where member states invest in social housing, for example, to really tackle the root cause of some of these energy poor, energy uh, social um, support which is needed. In that sense, when we speak, and that's my last point, about fair and affordable and just energy transition, we have enhanced the governments at EU level for energy poverty, we have a group on energy poverty, where we speak with experts from the member states, where we allow to share best practice, where I see a strong added value of the Commission, because there's a lot happening at the local, regional, national level, and our role is sometimes to bring those people together, like here today, but also in experts groups, and see what is happening in one country, can it be replicated in another country, can it be inspired to do the same or something similar, and that we do in our group on energy poverty. We have also an advisory hub where we design concrete projects to tackle energy poverty on the ground. So 
I think with these measures, we want to tackle the most vulnerable in the society and households. And together with the energy legis legislation, which I mentioned, the financing which we are setting up, the group which we are talking about, the Dublin Forum where we speak about consumers, these are all measures which are ongoing, which we are enhancing, uh, strengthening over the time. And my last word is now on measures we are adding, learning from the crisis, which I described in the beginning, which is the proposal which we published from the Commission side in March this year about the reform of the electricity market design. This is a target re targeted reform where we try to really look on how to prevent that there is these price spikes. We will all, all always have volatile prices, but what we want to avoid is really this extreme situation we saw last year. So in that reform of the electricity market design, we look again on how to empower and protect consumers. We look at long-term contracts where either private companies with other private companies can conclude uh, PPAs, what we call, or if there is public support that we have long-term contracts for difference, as we call it. And this is now being negotiated right as we speak with council and then also with parliament. So in this targeted reform of the electricity market design, we really want, for example, to enable consumer to switch from one energy provider to another. We want a better choice of contracts, not only with fixed prices, but also with variable prices. This is not the case in all of the member states. We want energy provider to really look at more long-term contracts, so to alleviate this short-term volatility. And I think with this market design where we are, as I said, still discussing, I think we have at the end, if it's concluded, hopefully by the end of the year, a lot of elements to be much better prepared in terms of crisis if it comes back, hopefully not, but if it comes back, that we are better prepared from the market side, from the consumer side, from the industry side. So I think with all those measures from the EU side, the big aim is really, as I said, to tackle those vulnerable consumer, to look at a just transition that everyone can profit from the clean transition, to look how to make lower bills and greater skills for everybody in the EU. So there are a lot of ongoing measures. We are accelerating those, but we are also always in dialogue with all stakeholders, with the member states in different fora. And I'm really looking forward of today's agenda where we can go a little bit deeper on some of the aspects I mentioned this morning. Many thanks for today. Thank you so much, Mechthild Wurstdorf. And indeed, we are going to dive deeper into these topics, energy efficiency and affordability uh, and inclusion. And you can also do so uh, right after this session with uh, Mrs. Wurstdorf. She's going to the Jen Jenkins Room, where there will be a policy session on heat pumps with uh, other people as well. And also here we'll have a policy session uh, on renewables and energy efficiency, finding the right mix to reduce fossil fuels. So if you'd like to do so, you can also, of course, follow uh, this session online. So if you'd like to follow this session online, just click on the right program. And uh, for the rest of the day, I wish you all the best and enjoy today and uh, see you tomorrow.